Why does you build it, you run it work so well, yet leave people feeling a little uncomfortable? What are the usual excuses? I mean, concerns. And how can you help people to overcome them? Hello, and welcome to the channel. If you haven't subscribed yet, you should do so now. That way you can stay up to date with all of the cool stuff that's happening here. I'm Steve Smith. I'm Cornish, and I'm the Global Head of Modernization and Platforms at Equal Experts. I'll be your host for today. I'm afraid Dave Farley isn't available. He's lost a bet to me, again, so he's had to put on a fake moustache and sneak over the Cornish border to bake me some proper Cornish pasties. You Build It, You Run It is where product teams build, test, deploy, and operate their own live software services. In my last video on the topic, which you can see here, I talked about the benefits of You Build It, You Run It, and I described a couple of the usual excuses. I mean, concerns that I hear about You Build It, You Run It. We'll cover a couple more today, and then there'll be one more video where I'll cover a few more. So many people tell me how much they love You Build It, You Run It. Yet then, in the same breath, they then say how it could never possibly work in their company for some mysterious reasons. And the mysterious reasons today will be You Build It, You Run It won't scale. And nobody would be doing instant management properly. Let's talk about why You Build It, You Run It won't scale, allegedly. I don't know why people have this idea that having 30 people on call is necessary with 30 teams. Like, it's simply not the case. That's not what you do with You Build It, You Run It. It's all about optimizing your out-of-hours support with the run costs that you can actually afford. That's kind of obvious. Think about outcomes insurance. Different insurance policies offer different levels of coverage at different premiums. The more valuable the contents of your home, the higher the coverage you'll want, the higher the premium you'll pay. So map out your teams and services, understand how revenue flows through those services, and then from that discern the financial exposure you face on failure. Then from that, you can understand where you want higher levels of coverage and where you want to pay a slightly higher premium. This model isn't perfect, but I've used it in large enterprise organizations and it's worked out pretty well. And besides, perfect isn't real. Your mapping will show you probably that you have a few teams with critical services where there's a lot of revenue flowing through those services out of hours. And those teams should have a dedicated on-call engineer in hours and out of hours. And as I've said before, you need to compensate people to be on call as well as to be called out you'll have a majority of services with a medium level of financial exposure, like a fair bit of revenue flowing through them. And in that case, I recommend in hours, you have a dedicated engineer on call and out of hours, you share rotors between teams operating in the same business domain. I urge you to use business domains to share on call rotors, not technology stacks, because it will lower cognitive load and drive better decision-making around product capabilities and technology architecture. This is a really effective way to minimize knowledge synchronization costs and balance it with your run cost. And finally, you will have a few services with non-critical, non-essential levels of revenue flowing through them. So in that case, you can have an engineer on call for each team in hours and out of hours have nothing. Now, by nothing, I mean no operations team looks after the service. I mean, you automatically shutter it or you, it just degrades on failure in some other way or you just leave it alone and the engineers fix it in the morning. This is how you can maximize incentives for engineers to care about reliability when they have a lower availability target, when they have a lower financial exposure, when they're not actually on call out of hours. It's by telling them, if this goes wrong at night, everyone's gonna notice. And it's the first thing for you to fix when you get into the office in the morning. All right, now let's look at there'd be no incident management. I don't quite understand this one. Like you already have some instant management processes in your organization. You can just plug into that with you build it, you run it and improve it. Then everybody wins. You connect instant managers with engineers. You want engineers to know that there's someone that they can contact when an instant is becoming a major instant, when they fear that a lot of money is being lost or a lot of brand reputation is being affected in incident. And you also want your instant managers to trust that engineers will phone them when that major instant begins to unfold. Map out your instant management process. 
automate away all of those spreadsheets and handoffs that you don't really like to talk about. Buy some SaaS if necessary. PagerDuty is good. It has bi-directional sync with ServiceNow or your system of record of choice. That will automatically improve the quantity and quality of your instant records, which will make your instant managers, your operations team, and your auditors much more comfortable with you build it, you run it. Here's the instant management workflow that I established at a British online auction site. They have some great platform engineering, so dashboards, alerts, and pager duty are all managed together. They're all allocated to services through a paved road. When an alert is fired, it's routed into pager duty, which then does three things. First of all, obviously, it contacts the engineer on call. The engineer then acknowledges the incident on an app on their phone. The incident is raised in service now or your system of record, and it's also triggering the creation of a Slack channel that's public discoverable. The name of the channel is the instant ID, and this allows stakeholders to follow along with instant response in real time without actually interrupting responders from their urgent tasks. This process means you can have a really smooth time to acknowledgement and a time to restore. And there's a special step here. You can model your instant manager or managers as a team in pager duty, and then you can tell your engineers, if you ever want to raise a major incident, all you have to do is to add that instant management team into your instant in pager duty. By doing that, pager duty will automatically call the instant manager, they're woken up, and then there's a wealth of information available to them in Slack and in ServiceNow, which will put them in a good mood right at the start of their journey through that major incident. Next time I'm here, I'll cover some more you build it your own at excuses. I mean, concerns. But Dave Farley has to bake those pasties for me first, and I've told him before his elaborate disguise has to stay on while he does it. Thanks for watching.